Hi, who's, who's left? <laughs> um, welcome everybody. This is a really, really, really special conversation. Um, we have promised you a deep dive into fashion today. We've gone deep and now we're going into the realm of science fiction turned reality. I can't wait to talk to our latest innovators. CEO Nika Ruby and her sister CTO Layla took a family background in fashion. Who remembers all those BB stores that we shopped at when we were we were t younger? A lot of us, right? Like you're not you're being quiet, but like I know that you did that. Um, uh, that's their uncle. After Nika got a degree in materials engineering and business at Berkeley, and Layla received her BS in computational neuroscience from Johns Hopkins University with an in-progress medical doctorate from Harvard Medical School, they decided, what should we do this weekend? Oh, we'll create fabric from thin air. Well, not our best air, carbon. Please welcome Nika and Layla. So, you're twins, you're brilliant, <laughs> you're gorgeous, um, and fashion was the family business. Um, somehow you decided not to grab a celebrity ambassador and start your own line of cozy loungewear. How come you didn't do that? <laughs> um, tell us about the path that led you to Ruby Technologies. Yes, um, it really feels like a lifetime in the making. Like you mentioned, our uncle was the founder of BB, and it just meant we grew up exposed to the design studio and the whole supply chain and really the art of fashion, and we fell in love. I think it's such a beautiful, really an art form. Mm -hmm. um, so we were inspired by fashion, but then we both became scientists, and I think that inspiration around the natural world and how can we make it better and our living situations better, I think was a driving force for ending up at Ruby. Myself, um, since I was 15 years old, I've been working in sustainable materials, published my first paper in artificial photosynthesis when I was 15. <laughs> since then, I've been working in different research labs and sustainable materials. Um, I was just really enthralled by this concept of um, all these problems and, and challenges that the world is facing. They're really uh, based in science, that you can just do things in different ways and solve these problems. And it's really an opportunity to change the way we do things. Wait, I'm just curious to back up. Like you, yeah. you, had, this, you were, had this passion for fashion. How did that not kind of go a more traditional way? Like why did you even, this is 15, yeah. why did you end up going the science path? True, um, so I think one, we grew up in Northern California surrounded by a lot of nature. Our family um, immigrated here from Iran, and we always ho uh, heard stories about um, the orchards and the farms and the nature that you know they used to have back there. And then I think also just other family members were scientists and, and doctors, and I think it was a mix of like family influence and, and really being inspired by nature. Uh, anything you'd add? Yeah, and, no. and how did you take? How did you decide f your path in the medical world? Yeah, so I'd say my path was a little, you know, crooked and all of that, but really happy with where I've landed. Um, around a similar timeline to Nika, um, I was working in research labs when I was around 15, um, but focused more on bioengineering. So I was really inspired by studying natural systems and then applying that to kind of disrupt the way that disease progress happens and how we can like use that to engineer different kinds of medicines to treat brain tumors and different things like that. So that naturally brought me to medical school. While I was in medical school, I will say I did have one lecture on um, climate change mm -hmm. and that really opened my eyes to the opportunity to apply this like strong research background that I had to actually create a solution that I thought would be like really, really widespread in climate. You call your sister that second and say, <laughs> I have our path. <laughs> <laughs> so she was actually working on Ruby at this time. And I was, this was kind of during the pandemic and I was feeling this like disillusionment with my path in medicine. And 
I felt like joining together with Nika, I felt we could really make something really impactful. Is that because you were never in class together, so you wanted to? <laughs> that side wanted story. Kind of like they were never in class together. I was asking them backstage. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to do something together. Finally. <laughs> no, yeah. we always sort of knew eventually we'd do something together. I, we didn't know if it would be a boutique or like a lemonade stand or whatever it was, but it ended up being this that I think really blends our two passions and backgrounds of of science and research, and then also fashion and wanting to make an impact. Um, yeah, no, it's it's ama it's amazing. I don't. Re nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> so let's start with what does net carbon negative mean? Yes. Yeah. So very simply, what that means is the CO2 that we take out of the atmosphere is greater than the amount of CO2 that's produced in manufacturing the material that we are producing. So we can go into a little bit more about the technology, because I think that go would be- Go into a lot more about the technology. <laughs> that would be very helpful. So what we're doing is creating carbon negative textiles for the apparel industry. And the way that we do that is with enzymes. And that probably sounds you know, crazy and like science fiction, but when you think about how a tree works, it breathes in CO2 from the air and binds it and uses that to create all of its structure. And that's essentially cellulose. And then we as humans cut down those trees and take that cellulose from those natural systems and use it to make things like fabric. So pretty much everything we're wearing can come from plants or trees um, and kind of contributes to the degradation of the climate and the world. Yeah, and so um, the scale of this problem is fashion is the third most CO2 polluting supply chain on the planet. And we didn't know that growing up in the industry and sort of discovered it on our journey. Um, and most of that is from raw material production, uh, which is what Leila's talking about, about processing these materials into fabric, let's say cutting down endangered forests or growing cotton and using a lot of water and energy to harvest it and turn it into right. materials. So that's what we're replacing. We're replacing this massive CO2 um, output that the industry does today with hopefully something that can be carbon negative and as widespread as fabric is today. Um, actually, <laughs> it has the potential to uh, account for half of the CO2 reduction that we as a planet need to do every year to hit our climate goals. Just fashion textiles. So it's, yeah. it's pretty exciting. So, so how, do you, how do you do this? Like kind of walk us through, because you're, you're not using any tangible substance to create fabric, right? We Ish? are, kind of. So like Leila mentioned, think of a tree, right? It's breathing in CO2 and then it builds up the whole tree structure. It makes its whole material basically from air, from CO2 in the air. We just think that that happened. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's like pretty incredible, like that's how trees like come to be wild. Um, we take similar technology where you can imagine like a big reactor system, maybe like a big pot. Um, we bubble in CO2 coming from the manufacturing facility or from the air. And in there, we have little molecules that grab the CO2 and turn it into things. So we can like harvest CO2 and turn it into like long-term durable goods that, so that's fabric, yes. So what comes out is like this pulp material, it's called cellulose pulp. It's a drop in replacement for existing sources of cellulose, so you can just use it in, in existing industrial manufacturing. So does the existing material that's being made, does it start out in that same pulpy way? Yeah, so I mean, it starts as a tree, they process it down into the pulp, which is most of the energy usage. So we basically skip all of that, right. take a completely different And you're not touching to a tree. Not touching right. a tree, there's no trees involved. No trees involved. No deforestation and carbon storage loss, which is massive over generations. And is that the viscose material? So what's viscose exactly? I know we see it on tags. Yes. What is it? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a family of textiles that come from tree or plant sources, basically natural cellulose. Um, and it's things like tops, bottoms, knits, satin, denim. These are Actually, all we're getting sold viscose and being told 
that it's organic and sustainable, but it's not. Is that yes. is that what's happening? I mean, so that's actually a huge revelation because we're taking, we're we're actually destroying trees and all the yeah. water and carbon and everything else that comes into it to make a fabric that we're selling as a sustainable, renewable fabric. Right. Yes? It's kind of, it's challenging because there's no solutions out there in fashion today really that can change the impact. Like when we say organic cotton or like a regenerative fabric or whatever, it's slightly better than maybe a polyester, but it's still contributing to fashion being the third most CO2 polluting supply right. chain on the Between planet. Water alone. Yes, water, right. CO2, like all these things. That's why we've taken the stance, we need to make a definitive solution that completely rethinks the industry um, and just supply chains in general. And this um, looks like viscose. Yes, whatever. same exact. What? So it's the same like, thing. This is probably viscose. Yeah. So <laughs> down to the molecular viscose. structure, it's the same exact material. So everything that we wear today and use in all of these different brands, we're making the same exact thing, but without you know cutting down a single tree. That that's crazy. Um, so you so you can take that and you can dye it. You can do anything. Mm -hmm. Do you need special like machines to to do something with it, or you no. can how, like how does it how does it go from like a little clumpy thing to fabric to make clothes? Totally. The process is the same as what's currently done. So that pulpy thing is pushed through, you can imagine like a shower head. Uh -huh. So this thing with like lots of holes, it becomes thin fibers. And then that is turned into yarns and then knitted into garments or woven into like denims. Um, so we follow all those same industrial processes. Wow. So, um, so I mean, obviously, it's, I, my question is how many trees can you save in this process and how much water does it use? So it's basically none. Yeah, so I mean, today, just for textiles, 200 million trees are cut down every year, typically from endangered forests, just to make textiles. Um, so if we can replace these current materials with a completely new production method that, that we've developed, it would eliminate the need to destroy all of that habitat and cut down those trees and also use like a fraction of the water, 0.01% of what's used in cotton or for growing other. So how, where are you in like, like when can we buy this? <laughs> like where are you in your process of, are you working, are, are you able to scale it to a different degree? Mm -hmm. Do you, are you, would you be sharing this technology with companies? Are you looking for designers? Okay, that's like a lot of questions, but like, <laughs> I, we want to know them. Yeah, so the answer is sooner than you think. Um, we are going to be partnering with brands to bring this fabric into stores and make it a reality so that every single one, every single person here can go into a store and buy our fabric and we'll, from what, their favorite What will brand. it be called? We don't know yet. We're still oh, working TBD. on it. We need a copy. <laughs> yeah. And like, wait, are we talking about like two years, five years? So I'll, I'll give a little sneak preview that we haven't <laughs> given before, but uh, we're working with dozens of tier one fashion brands, probably all the ones you guys know um, this year. So stay tuned for some news about our partnerships, but you can expect next year to be able to buy in very limited quantities <laughs> some amount of uh, the same garments you might have otherwise purchase, but from a carbon negative, planet positive material, ours. <laughs> That's amazing. Is, but so uh, incredible, <laughs> right? Wow. Is this is, uh, like, are you, do you, will you own the patent for all of this? Is this like, how does that work? It, is it, will everybody have to license this technology from you? N no. So we did develop the technology. We have the patents, um, but how it works is in the same way that fiber, fibers for yarns and stuff are being produced today, we'd supply those fibers to fashion brands where they could use it for all of their garments. And we have no interest in charging a premium, a green premium um, at all, because we want this to be as widespread as possible right. to achieve the scale necessary to solve the climate crisis. Um, so it's something actually that we project can be cheaper than current uh, sources of fabric. I'm sure because you're not We're doing all of that. All those right, steps. that's like a ton right. of, of steps. 
But you will still, in other words, you will still have a part in all of the brands that use. It's not like per garment, but you will be. In, I'm like worried about your you making money. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you don't need to worry. <laughs> so basically, like, we produce the materials. The brands pay us for that material. So you um, will still sort of own that material. Yeah. So you're going to have to scale your business to satisfy like an entire industry. Yes, but what's what's helpful about our process is it's innately very scalable. The CO2 going in turns into material directly right there in minutes, whereas like we don't need to grow a forest, we just have a production right. line that can make the same amount of material in one facility. Um, and the, another interesting thing is that we can co-locate the reactor anywhere that there is textile manufacturing. And that's something that we've been looking into deeply to cut down on transportation, CO2, and all of that. Right, so, so it, it could, could be really local. Be, it could be local, it could be right next to other garment you know, areas, it could be anywhere that you know, we think has a great opportunity to have that direct on-site production of materials from the air. Wow. So this is for viscose. You can't do silk or anything like that. Is this, or are you, or is that like coming soon? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, so we're starting first with cellulose textiles, okay. which is viscose. And the vision is that this builds a platform where we can make other natural materials from CO2 in the same way. So silk is a protein. So we could do the same thing and actually directly make proteins, make silk, proteins for food, um, use cellulose for building materials, packaging. It's really like redeveloping the way the world produces things that needs to happen to solve the climate crisis. And we're excited to hopefully drive that in a planet positive way. That's, um, I think the challenge is throughout a lot of industrial human history, uh, the way we do things has always been like degrading the planet. Yeah. But if you like take inspiration from you were talking earlier today in other panels about um, the philosophies of indigenous communities and something we've always been inspired by is how can we rethink supply chains to be symbiotic with the planet and live in harmony and so that as we produce things we don't need to take from right. the planet or harm it uh, in a way that's not sustainable it can actually be an ecosystem in the way that it's supposed to be that like we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. The trees breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen. It's beautiful. It's, it, <laughs> so we need supply amazing. chains that can do that. Um, I, I know that we're like at the end of our, our day, but <laughs> does anybody have any questions? Because like this is so fascinating. Oh, thank you so much for y what you're doing. Um, I think it's amazing and we need it. Um, what would you say that is, your technology, will it help with landfill situations? You know how right now we have so many textiles, especially because it's oxygen generated. And my second question is, does it does the material break down? Is it biodegradable? Yes, definitely. That was key in us developing this technology and calling it planet positive. So it biodegrades. There are no plastics, microplastics involved because um, that's something that we don't see as sustainable. So biodegradable, for sure. And then for the recycling, the landfill and hopefully recycling challenge, um, you know, textiles are becoming recycled at higher rates. And the challenge with, with that whole system is that when you recycle textiles to avoid it from going to a landfill or something like that, the quality degrades, so you often have to blend it with new fiber or new material. And so what's one thing that is a really great opportunity for our company to help boost the recycling of um, textiles is we can provide the new material that's planet positive to help the recycled material be used more in the industry and actually have a larger impact. Um, so that's one thing I'm really excited about. And then, of course, it can be recycled in the same way that uh, viscose is recycled today, mechanical, chemical recycling, if, if like a garment gets to end of life and is recycled. So recycling, yes, biodegradable, yes. <laughs> and hopefully will help the recycling uh, process grow a little bit in the industry. That's incredible. Yep. Any, anybody else have? Hi, this is Maya. I just want to say I am completely geeking out over <laughs> here because right? Maya, I, right? It's amazing. Because I, I come from um, sustainable fashion, and the thing I really love about the work that you're doing is you're deploying like one of my favorite 
techniques. I teach biomimicry, and everything you describe is is biomimicry. When you're giving the the illustration about how you know the trees, you know, and and then par that how that parallels to you know the your technology, your incredible technology. And I just want to ask, you know, how important do you feel when it comes to sustainability solutions? How important do you feel it is for people to you know, humans to use more bio-inspired technologies and processes, you know, to learn from nature's intelligence in, in their innovations. Because that's, you're an amazing example of that. And I, I, I feel like you, <laughs> that's something that you advocate for. <laughs> Thank you so much. That means a lot. Um, I think we have so much to learn from Earth. I mean, I think it's, we're scientists. We've studied this our whole career, just like how the Earth works. And it's truly beautiful. and. It's like a perfect harmony, symphony, always going on every day. So I feel like our systems that we use as humans should mimic like bio systems if we're ever going to be sustainable, live in harmony with our planet, um, be you know have longevity in our our system and everything. Um, so yeah, I definitely think even beyond this one application that, that we're focused on, I think there's so much incredible stuff to learn from nature. Like even just like the, there's so much in like the design of wing structures that mimic nature and uh, so much like genius in evolution that like now we're trying to mimic through like machine learning or AI and, and do it uh, through models really quickly. But you can see what has been created over millennia on earth which is like a great quick way to, to get to the output of an ML or AI model or something. Uh, so yeah, so much to learn from, from nature. I think we should. Yeah. Um, like Maya, this is amazing. This is just beyond uh, amazing. I actually work with like a lot of brands like Patagonia and whatnot. I think one of the questions that I always hear within those conversations around materials is durability. How long would it last? So like, how long does this material last if it is biodegradable? You know, yeah. Of course. So because we're making the same material that Patagonia and other companies are already using, it's the same durability profile. Um, they're actually one of the, the people that we're working with. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, very excited to work with them. But of course, durability is so important. And also to us, like we now buy all of our clothing secondhand, thrifted, thread up is so great. Like all of the future clothes that the industry makes needs to be incredibly durable and something that can have long multiple owner life cycles. So even beyond standard, which is what we definitely achieve now, there's some R&D we're working on where we can actually make it more durable, uh, last longer, uh, things down in the chemical structure that we can make the polymers a little bit more durable that we're excited about too. I think stuff like that is gonna become more and more um, critical and I'm so glad we had so many great conversations today about um, reuse and, and long lifetime of clothes. I think it's critical. Hey. First of all, I can't wait to see what you two are up to over the next few decades. This is amazing already. <laughs> right. um, but this is more, maybe more of a philosophical question. You talked about price parity and wanting to make sure everyone has access to this. I'm just curious, especially given the last two conversations about fast fashion and the kind of overall consumption culture, how you're thinking about which brands you would work with or wouldn't, and whether you want to be a part of those supply chains or uh, that's not something that you're interested in, in being involved in. Of course. It's such an important important problem um, and when we're choosing our pilot partners today we make sure that they have sustainability missions and that they find uh, innovation in the space important but what we're aiming to do as we start building our brand and have more I guess like power in the industry is using that to kind of push brands to adopt ethical like more ethical and, and social standards. I think if brands realize that consumers really want carbon negative, planet positive materials, and they can only get it from us if they meet our criteria in supply chain, um, that is a really powerful thing. And I think we have 
that power. We just need to <laughs> sort of strategize as we're building these partnerships. Um, and I think it's been really important for us in building our company to bring in the people that we want to see reflected in the whole you know, climate mission. So most of our employees are immigrants, people of color, um, women. We think like th bringing those voices into the conversation is going to be super critical to building, you know, a sustainable supply chain. Yeah. And, making, and it's not yeah. even like bringing those voices in. It's right. like those are the voices that matter in this conversation. And for if you imagine a supply chain of the future, like who do you want to be driving that? Like who do you want behind it? You want the people who uh, climate change is most affecting now, who know the most about these systems. Um, who care and want to create change. And that's the kind of like demographic we're building at our company too. So I think even, even beyond that, with the company we're building, like Layla was mentioning, we, we want all of these social and ethical standards to be kind of baked in. Do we have any more questions? Nope, we're, we're go you know what? Do you wanna do one more? <laughs> I could keep asking. Um, I know you touched on landfills, but as you're talking, I'm, see I'm seeing how l with landfills, especially because they omit so much of the methane, you know, methane gases, is there a way that what you're doing, because you're scientists, mm -hmm. to just do the enzymes that will take care of the landfills? We, we have Atacama, we have Ghana, we have all over the world this landfill problem. Yeah. I'm, I'm a trash artist, and I do landfill art. I, as, as one of my mediums, I, I use various uh, different uh, categories to get my message across. Mm -hmm. But at hearing you, I was thinking like, is that something that you all can create to, to help with these landfills? Yes, that is such a great idea. I think there's like, I, I love your ideation because there's like infinite options with science to solve problems like this. So just thinking about that problem, you know, there have been bacteria discovered in various landfills that break down plastics and can break it down into biological materials that can be reused in ecosystems. So when you extrapolate that out, like maybe there's something that can be developed using similar pathways or metabolisms of something that can easily break down all of the components in a landfill uh, through an industrial process that then just becomes like something really benign and um, or like goes back to the elements that you can reconstruct new materials from. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and I think another point there is, so we, you know, in our system, take CO2 from the air and turn it into things, but methane is just, you another know. Another great molecule. Yeah, <laughs> carbon and hydrogen. So there are so many applications of those kinds of elements and materials. So using enzymes that naturally react with methane in an alternative system, I think, is another Incredible idea. <laughs> Love it. I mean, considering that you're doing this in the fashion world, you have potentially the ability to go into different sectors in life. Totally. It seems like it's endless for, for where, you, where you sort of landed with this. It's exciting. Of course, we need to like make it happen. The execution is the hardest part. And well, I thought that we were getting close next year. Yes. So I'm <laughs> we're working really hard, but exactly. I think the, the potential is really exciting and, and massive. Um, I'd love for you guys all to join the journey. <laughs> I mean, I think this is amazing. And this, what a great way to, to end the Emma Impact Summit this year. Um, this is definitely, as I said, it's like science fiction, but it's real. And, and I think that that's really what we're looking to do. So thank you so much. Thank you. For thank you. being here. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Um, so much.